Get comfortable, ladies and gentlemen. Open your ears, sit back, and relax, and get set for an unbelievable revelation tonight. You're going to want copies of this tape, this tape of The Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Ah, yes, the seed that lies beneath the snow in the springtime becomes the rose. I'm going to begin tonight's broadcast, ladies and gentlemen, by reading a portion of the introduction of a book entitled Born in Blood by John J. Robinson, The Lost Secrets of Freemasonry. Now, you should seek out this book, purchase it, and read it. It is a wonderful addition to your own library. And I begin now. Quote, the research behind this book was not originally intended to reveal anything about Freemasonry or the Knights Templar. Its objective had been to satisfy my own curiosity about certain unexplained aspects of the Peasants' Revolt in England in 1381, a savage uprising that saw upwards of a hundred thousand Englishmen march on London. They moved in uncontrolled rage, burning down manor houses, breaking open prisons, and cutting down any who stood in their way. One unsolved mystery of that revolt was the organization behind it. For several years, a group of disgruntled priests of the lower clergy had traveled to the towns, preaching against the riches and corruption of the church. During the months before the uprising, secret meetings had been held throughout central England by men weaving a network of communication. After the revolt was put down, rebel leaders confessed to being agents of a, quote, great society, unquote, said to be based in London. So very little is known of that alleged organization that several scholars have solved the mystery simply by deciding that no such secret society ever existed. Another mystery was the concentrated and especially vicious attacks on the religious order of the Knights Hospitaller of St. John, now known as the Knights of Malta. Not only did the rebels seek out their properties for vandalism and fire, but their prior was dragged from the Tower of London to have his head struck off and placed on London Bridge to the delight of the cheering mob. There was no question that the ferocity unleashed on the crusading hospitallers had a purpose behind it. One captured rebel leader, when asked the reasons for the revolt, said, quote, First and above all, the destruction of the hospitallers, unquote. What kind of secret society could have had that special hatred as one of its primary purposes? A desire for vengeance against the hospitallers was easy to identify in the rival crusading order of the Knights of the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. The problem was that those Knights Templar had been completely suppressed almost seventy years before the Peasants' Revolt, following several years during which the Templars had been imprisoned, tortured, and burned at the stake. After issuing the decree that put an end to the Templar order, Pope Clement V had directed that all of the extensive properties of the Templars should be given to the Hospitallers. Could a Templar desire for revenge actually have survived underground for three generations? There was no incontrovertible proof Yet the only evidence suggests the existence of just one secret society in 14th century England, just one, the society that was or would become the order of free and accepted Masons. There appeared to be no connection, however, between the revolt 
and Freemasonry, except for the name or title of its leader. He occupied the center stage of English history for just eight days, and nothing is known of him except that he was the supreme commander of the rebellion. He was called Walter the Tyler, and it seemed at first to be mere coincidence that he bore the title of the enforcement officer of the Masonic Lodge. In Freemasonry, the Tyler, who must be a master mason, is the sentry, the sergeant-at-arms, and the officer who screens the credentials of visitors who seek entrance to the lodge. In remembrance of an earlier, more dangerous time, his post is just outside the door of the lodge room, where he stands with a drawn sword in his hand even to this day. I was aware that there had been many attempts in the past to link the Freemasons with the Knights Templar, but never with success. The fragile evidence advanced by proponents of that connection had never held up, sometimes because it was based on wild speculation, and at least once because it had been based on a deliberate forgery. But despite the failures to establish that link, it just will not go away, and the time-shrouded belief in some relationship between the two orders remains as one of the more durable legends of Freemasonry. That is entirely appropriate, because all of the various theories of the origins of Freemasonry are legendary. Not one of them is supported by any universally accepted evidence. Ah, here I break from reading from the introduction of the book and interject a comment here. There was never any universally accepted evidence until you hear what you're going to hear tonight produced by John Galt, an agent of the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence. The connection, dear listeners, is in the genealogy of the families of the elite. You are going to be amazed, and now I continue from the introduction to Born in Blood. I was not about to travel down that time-worn trail and decided to concentrate my efforts on digging deeper into the history of the Knights Templar to see if there was any link between the suppressed Knights and the secret society behind the Peasants' Revolt. In doing so, I thought that I would be leaving Freemasonry far behind, and I couldn't have been more mistaken. Like anyone curious about medieval history, I had developed an interest in the Crusades, and perhaps more than just an interest. Those holy wars hold an appeal that is frequently as romantic as it is historical, and in my travels I had tried to drink in the atmosphere of the narrow defiles in the mountains of Lebanon through which crusader armies had passed, and had sat staring at the castle ruins around Sidon and Tyre, trying to hear the clashing sounds of attack and defense. I had marveled at the walls of Constantinople, and had strolled the arsenal of Venice, where crusader fleets were assembled. I had sat in the round church of the Knights Templar in London, trying to imagine the ceremony of its consecration by the Patriarch of Jerusalem in 1185, more than three hundred years before Columbus set sail west to the Indies. The Templar Order was founded in Jerusalem in 1118 in the aftermath of the First Crusade. Its name came from the location of its first headquarters on the site of the ancient Temple of Solomon, helping to fulfill a desperate need for a standing army in the Holy Land. The Knights of the Temple soon grew in numbers, in wealth, and in political power. They also grew in arrogance, and their Grand Master, de Radford, was a key figure in the mistakes that led to the fall of Jerusalem in 1187. The Latin Christians managed to hold on to a narrow strip of territory along the coast where the Templars were among the largest owners of the land and the fortifications. Finally, the enthusiasm for sending men and money to the Holy Land, wand among the European kingdoms, which were preoccupied with their own wars against each other. By 1296, the Egyptian sultan was able to push the resident crusaders, along with the military orders, into the sea. The Holy Land was lost. And the defeated Knights Templar moved their base to the island kingdom of Cyprus, dreaming of yet one more crusade to restore their past glory. As the Templars planned a new crusade against the infidel, King Philip IV of France was planning his own private crusade against the Templars. 
He longed to be rid of his massive debts to the Templar Order, which had used its wealth to establish a major international banking operation. Philip wanted the Templar treasure to finance his continental wars against Edward I of England. After two decades of fighting, England on one side and the Holy Roman Church on the other, two unrelated events gave Philip of France the opportunity he needed. Edward I died, and his deplorably weak son took the throne of England as Edward II. On the other front, Philip was able to get his own man on the throne of Peter as Pope Clement V. When word arrived on Cyprus that the new pope would mount a crusade, the Knights Templar thought that their time of restoration to glory was at hand. Summoned to France, their aging Grand Master, Jacques de Molay, went armed with elaborate plans for the rescue of Jerusalem. In Paris he was humored and honored until the fatal day. At dawn, on Friday the 13th of October, in the year 1307, every Templar in France was arrested and put in chains on Philip's orders. Their hideous torture for confessions of heresy began immediately. When the Pope's orders to arrest the Templars arrived at the English court, young Edward II took no action at all. He protested to the pontiff that the Templars were innocent. Only after the Pope issued a formal bull on November the 22nd in the year 1307 was the English king forced to act. In January in the year 1308, Edward finally issued orders for the arrest of the Knights Templar in England. But the three months of warning had been put to good use. Many of the Templars had gone underground, while some of those arrested managed to escape. Their treasure, their jeweled reliquies, even the bulk of their records, had totally disappeared. In Scotland, the papal order was not even published. Under those conditions, England, and especially Scotland, became targeted havens for fugitive Templars from continental Europe, and the efficiency of their concealment spoke to some assistance from outside or from each other. The English throne passed from Edward II to Edward III, who bequeathed the crown to his ten-year-old grandson, who, as Richard II watched from the tower as the peasants' revolt exploded throughout the city of London. Much had happened to the English people along the way. Incessant wars had drained most of the king's treasury, and corruption had taken the rest. A third of the population had perished in the Black Death, and famine exacted further tolls. The reduced labor force of farmers and craftsmen found that they could earn more for their labor, but their increased income came at the expense of land-owning barons and bishops, who were not prepared to tolerate such a state of affairs. Laws were passed to reduce wages and prices to pre-plague levels, and genealogies were searched to reimpose the bondage of serfdom and villainage on men who thought themselves free. The king's need for money to fight his French wars inspired new and ingenious taxes. The oppression was coming from all sides, and the pot of rebellion was brought to the boil. Religion didn't help either. The land-owning church was as merciless a master as the land-owning nobility. Religion would have been a source of confusion for the fugitive Templars as well. They were a religious body of warrior monks who owed allegiance to no man on earth except the Holy Father, according to the Holy Father, but according to the Templars in secret. Their allegiance was only to themselves. When their Pope turned on them, chained them, beat them, he broke their link with God. In 14th century Europe, there was no pathway to God except through the Vicar of Christ on earth. If the Pope rejected the Templars, and the Templars rejected the Pope, they had to find a new way to worship their God, at a time when any variation from the teachings of the established church was blasted as heresy. That dilemma called to mind the central tenet of Freemasonry, which requires only that a man believe in a supreme being, with no requirements as to how he worships the deity of his choice. In Catholic Britain, such a belief would have been a crime but it would have accommodated the fugitive Templars who had been cut off from the universal church. In consideration of the extreme punishment for heresy, such an independent belief also made sense of one of the more mysterious of Freemasonry's old charges, the ancient rules that still govern the conduct of the fraternity. 
The charge says that no mason should reveal the secrets of a brother that may deprive him of his life and property. That connection caused me to take a different look at the Masonic old charges. They took on new direction and meaning when viewed as a set of instructions for a secret society created to assist and protect fraternal brothers on the run and in hiding from the church. That characterization made no sense in the context of a medieval guild of stonemasons, the usual claim for the roots of Freemasonry. It did make a great deal of sense, however, for men such as the fugitive Templars whose very lives depended upon their concealment. Nor would there have been any problem in finding new recruits over the years ahead. There were to be plenty of protesters and dissidents against the church among future generations. The rebels of the Peasants' Revolt proved that when they attacked abbeys and monasteries and when they cut the head off the Archbishop of Canterbury, the leading Catholic prelate in England, the fugitive Templars would have needed a code such as the old charges of masonry, but the working stone maces clearly did not. It had become obvious that I needed to know more about the ancient order of free and accepted masons. The extent of the Masonic material available at large public libraries surprised me, as did the fact that it was housed in the Department of Education and Religion. Not content with just what was generally available to the public, I asked to use the library in the Masonic Temple in Cincinnati, Ohio. By the way, folks, Cincinnati, Ohio is an extremely important location in this country, the United States. I told the gentleman there that I was not a Freemason, but wanted to use the library as part of my research for a book that would probably include a new examination of the Masonic Order. His only question to me was, quote, will it be fair, unquote. I assured him that I had no desire or intention to be anything other than fair, to which he replied, quote, good enough, unquote. I was left alone with the catalog and the hundreds of Masonic books that lined the walls. I also took advantage of the publications of the Masonic Service Association at Silver Springs, Maryland. Later, as my growing knowledge of Masonry enabled me to sustain a conversation on the subject, I began to talk to Freemasons. At first, I wondered how I would go about meeting fifteen or twenty Masons, and if I could meet them, would they be willing to talk to me? The first problem was solved as soon as I started asking friends and associates if they were Masons. There were four in one group I had known for about five years, and many more among men I had known for twenty years and more, without ever realizing that they had any connection with Freemasonry. As for the second part of my concern, I found them quite willing to talk not about the secret passwords and hand grips, by then I already knew them, but about what they had been taught concerning the origins of Freemasonry and its ancient old charges. They were as intrigued as I about the possibilities of discovering the lost meanings of words, symbols, and ritual for which no logical explanation was available such as why a master mason is told in his initiation rites that, quote, this degree will make you a brother to pirates and corsairs, unquote. And folks, I'll explain that to you <laughs> a little later. We agreed that unlocking the secrets of those Masonic mysteries would contribute most to unearthing the past, because the loss of their true meanings had caused the ancient terms and symbols to be preserved intact, less subject to change over the centuries are by adaptations to new conditions. Among those lost secrets were the meanings of words used in the Masonic rituals, words like Tyler, Cohen, Dugard, and Jewiz. Masonic writers have struggled for centuries without success to make those words fit with their preconceived conviction that Masonry was born in the English-speaking guilds of medieval stonemasons. Now I would test the possibility that there was indeed a connection between Freemasonry and the French-speaking Templar order by looking for the lost meanings of those terms, not in English, but in medieval French. The answers began to flow, and soon a sensible meaning for every one of the mysterious Masonic terms was established in the French language. It even provided the first credible meaning for the name of Hiram Abiff, the murdered architect of the Temple of Solomon, who is the central figure of Masonic ritual. The examination established something else as well. It is well known that in 1362 the English courts officially changed the language used for court proceedings from French to English. 
So the French roots of all the mysterious terms of Freemasonry confirmed the existence of that secret society in the 14th century, the century of the Templar suppression and the peasants revolt. With that encouragement, I addressed other lost secrets of masonry, the circle and mosaic pavement on the lodge room floor, gloves and lambskin aprons, the symbol of the compass in the square, even the mysterious legend of the murder of Hiram Abiff. The rule, customs, and traditions of the Templars provided answers to all of those mysteries. Next came a deeper analysis of the old charges of ancient masonry that define a secret society of mutual protection. What the, quote, lodge, unquote, was doing was assisting brothers in hiding from the wrath of church and state, providing them with money, vouching for them with the authorities, even providing the, quote, lodging, unquote, that gave Freemasonry the unique, unique term for its chapters and their meeting rooms. There remained no reasonable doubt in my mind that the original concept of the secret society that came to call itself Freemasonry had been born as a society of mutual protection among fugitive Templars and their associates in Britain, men who had gone underground to escape the imprisonment and torture that had been ordered for them by Pope Clement V. Their antagonism toward the Church was rendered more powerful by its total secrecy. The suppression of the Templar order appeared to be one of the biggest mistakes the Holy See has ever made. In return, Freemasonry has been the target of more angry papal bulls and encyclicals than any other secular organization in Christian history. Those condemnations began just a few years after Masonry revealed itself in 1717 and grew in intensity, culminating in the bull Humanum Genus, promulgated by Pope Leo XIII in 1884. In it, the Masons are accused of espousing religious freedom, the separation of church and state, the education of children by laymen, and the extraordinary crime of believing that people have the right to make their own laws and to elect their own government. Quote, according to the new principles of liberty, unquote. You see, folks, and this is an aside, all of our forefathers who established this country were Freemasons, and their intent is spelled out in Latin on the reverse of the great seal of the United States of America, where it plainly says, Novus Ordo Cyclorum, the New World Order. And I will interpret all of the meaning of the symbols on that great seal according to their true meaning and not the meaning that you will read in certain disinformation books written by Freemasons to steer you down the wrong road. Such concepts are identified along with the Masons as part of the kingdom of Satan. The document not only defines the concerns of the Catholic Church about Freemasonry at that time, but in the negative, so clearly defines what Freemasons believe that I have included the complete text of that papal bull as an appendix to this book, and I urge you all to get this book and read it. Finally, it should be added that the events described here were part of a great watershed of Western history. The feudal age was coming to a close. Land and the peasant labor on it had lost its role as the sole source of wealth. Merchant families banded into guilds and took over whole towns with charters as municipal corporations. Commerce led to banking and investment, and towns became power centers to rival the nobility in wealth and influence. The universal church, which had fought for a position of supremacy in a feudal context, was slow to accept changes that might affect that supremacy. Any material disagreement with the church was called heresy, the most heinous crime under heaven. The heretic not only deserved death, but the most painful death imaginable. Some dissidents run for the woods and hide, while others organize. In the case of the Fugitive Knights Templar, the organization already existed. They possessed a rich tradition of secret operations that had been raised to the highest level through their association with the intricacies of Byzantine politics, the secret ritual of the assassins and the Roshaniya, and the intrigues of the Moslem courts, which they met alternately on the battlefield or at the conference table. The church, in its bloody rejection of protest and change, provided them with a river of recruits that flowed 
for centuries. More than 600 years have passed since the suppression of the Knights Templar, but their heritage lives on in the largest fraternal organization ever known. And so the story of those tortured crusading knights, of the savagery of the peasants' revolt, and of the lost secrets of Freemasonry becomes the story of the most successful secret society in the history of the world. I've got to take a break, folks. Don't go away. I'll be right back after this very short pause. When a star is born, it possesses a gift or two. Spurned by God in the form of the vicar of Christ on earth, the Pope, and spurning God in their turn, the Knights Templars banded together in secret and formed what was to become known as Freemasonry. Now the legend goes that Freemasonry sprang up from ancient stone cutters, guilds, and the men who built the stone buildings of the age. But Freemason actually comes from the French, Freemason, which literally means the sons of light. Which light? Well, certainly in researching the problem, it is not the light of Christ. It is the light of the fallen angel of light. For when they were forsaken by the church, by Christ's vicar on earth, the Pope, they spurned God and turned to Lucifer. They held to the Luciferian philosophy that the gift of intellect by Lucifer through his agent Satan would in its turn make man God. These men were always on the run. They took the hidden Templar wealth and built a financial empire that stands to this day as the most powerful on the earth. Jews who had traditionally been persecuted throughout Europe flocked to the hidden temple. For there they could believe as they wished and worship whatever God they wished. For all were welcome. Many of the Templars running to ground flocked to England and to Scotland, where they fought for Robert the Bruce, who was engaged in an intense battle with the King of England. Now, let me regress just a little bit. King William the Lion, who was born in 1165 and died in 1214, had a daughter, Isabel of Scotland. Well, Isabel married a certain Robert Rose. Robert Rose was a Knight Templar, who was heavily involved in the first efforts and was very successful at international banking. Plus, he established the first overt and covert international intelligence gathering organization, which all, all subsequent intelligence organizations have been based upon since. His son, Sir William Ruse, and his daughter, Lucy Ruse, figure prominently in the story to follow. Lucy married Sir Robert Plumpton. They sired two children, Sir William Plumpton and Alice Plumpton. During this period of time, this family, this family, as the Knights Templar were going to ground, and the male progeny of this family, always followed their father's footsteps and entered into the order they established in secret the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry and may have had a significant role in the establishment for intelligence reasons of the order known as the Ancient Order of the Rose and Cross. Now, Alice Plumpton married Sir John Boatler. They gave birth to a daughter, Alice Boatler, who then married John Gerard, who had a child, Constance, who married Sir Alex Standish. The following children issued from that marriage, Ralph Standish, Sir Alex Standish, Roger Standish, and Alice Standish, who then married James Prescott. The children of this marriage were Roger Prescott, Ralph Prescott, John Prescott, and Captain Jonathan Prescott. Jonathan Prescott married Rebecca Buckley. 
They had two children, Abel Prescott and Lucy Prescott, and Lucy married Jonathan Fay. They sired three children, Samuel Prescott Phillips Fay, Samuel Howard Fay, and Harriet Eleanor Fay. Harriet married Reverend James Smith Bush, son of merchant Obadiah Bush. Their son, Samuel Prescott Bush, became the president of Buckeye Steel Castings Company of Ohio, a pioneer family of Franklin, Ohio, between Dayton and Cincinnati, and was one of the members of the Golden Circle and Order of the Quest, also known as the Jason Society, which gave issue to most of the political elite of the United States of America, who are, by the way, all, and I mean all without exception, related to each other. Now Samuel Prescott Bush married, and his son Prescott Bush became a U.S. Senator from Connecticut, the director of Prudential Insurance, the director of CBS, a partner in Brown Brother Harriman, Chairman National Republican Finance Committee, funds placed in Merrill Lynch accounts in Switzerland under the guidance of Donald Reagan. When he married, that marriage gave issue to the following. Prescott Bush II, an investment banker indicted for fraudulent banking practices. George Bush, chairman of Zapata Oil from 1963 to 64, chairman of the Republican Party, Harris County, Texas, when John F. Kennedy was killed. Delegate to the GOP National Convention, 1964. 1968 member of the 90th and 91st Congress from Texas. From 1965 to 66, Nixon appointed Bush as ambassador to the United Nations to deal with China. He was the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, chairman of the National GOP Party, vice president of the United States of America, and president of the United States of America. Four other children were William H. Bush, James Bush, Jonathan Bush, and Nancy, who married Alex Ellis. The issue of George and Barbara Bush was Dorothy, who married William LeBond, John Ellis Bush, Neil Bush, son of the director of CIA, becomes director of Silverado Savings and Loan and launders CIA drug money. Silverado loses over $100 million, and Neil goes unpunished. And the two other children, Marvin Pierce Bush and George Bush II. Folks, this intelligence was gathered by one of our agents codenamed John Galt, who spent literally years in dusty libraries and books of genealogy. And I'm not going to tell you which libraries or how he arrived at this information, but it has been checked. It is absolutely accurate, and this is just one portion of the pedigree of George Bush, who's literally related to most of the royal families of Europe. Now you can have a copy of this chart if you want it. I'll tell you how to get it later, so have your pencils and paper ready. And I'm going to tell you exactly where the money goes. One half of the money goes to help pay for the airtime here. The other half goes to our agent, John Galt, to pay for the years of toil in dusty library books that nobody ever looks in, tracing genealogy and folks, this is only one of the charts that he has furnished to us, along with others, other agents of the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence, who are engaged in the exact same research. And we have found that our most productive connections of the secret societies, the royal families, and what's happening in the world today is through genealogy. We have found a direct connection between the Peasants' Rebellion in England, the French Revolution, the Ronald Reagan and George Bush political campaign, and the George Bush political campaign. As far as the Peasants' Rebellion goes, the Encyclopedia Britannica calls it a, quote, curiously spontaneous rebellion. Barbara Tushman, in her 14th century history, a distant mirror, 
said that the rebellion spread, quote, with some evidence of planning. Winston Churchill went even further. In his work, The Birth of Britain, he wrote, quote, Throughout the summer of 1381, there was a general ferment. Beneath it all lay organization. Agents moved around the villages of central England in touch with a, quote, great society, unquote, which was said to meet in London. The spark of rebellion was being fanned vigorously, and finally the signal was given. Even though he had been arrested, excommunicated, and even now was a prisoner in the ecclesiastic prison at Maidstone in Kent, letters went out from priest John Ball and from other priests who followed him. Clerics were then the only literate class, so letters must have been received by local priests and were obviously intended to be shared with or read aloud to others. They all contained a signal to act now, which could put to rest the concept that the rebellion was simply a spontaneous convulsion of frustration that just happened to affect a hundred thousand Englishmen all at the same time. This from a letter from John Ball. In it he says, quote, John Ball gritteth you well all and doth you to understand he hath rung in your bell." Now right and might, while and skyle, God speed every dale, which means ideal, now is time. Unquote. From priest Jake Carter, quote, You have great need to take God with you in all your deeds, for now is time to be war. Unquote. From priest Jake Truman, Quote, Jake Truman, doth you to understand that falseness and guile have reigned too long, and truth hath been set under a lock, and falseness reigneth in every flock? God do boat, for now is time. Unquote. Now you'll notice that in every one of those quotes there was one phrase that stands out, and that phrase is, Now is time. One letter from John Ball, quote, St. Mary Priest, unquote, is worth quoting in its entirety. Even with the medieval English spelling, the meaning will be clear. Lechery and gluttony were frequent points in his accusations of high church leaders. Quote, John Ball sent Mary Priest great well all manner men bides him in the name of the Trinity, Father and Son and Holy Ghost, Stand mainly together in truth, and help is truth, and truth shall help you. Now reigneth pride in prize, and covets is hold, wise and lechery, withouten shame, and gluttony withouten blame. Envy reigneth with trason, and sloth is take in great season. God do boat, for now is time. Amen. Unquote. Now, folks, if you research the history of the French Revolution, you will hear that the spark, the word that spread through the country like wildfire that ignited the rebellion in France, was, quote, now is the time literally the same phrase. Some say that in the American Revolution the same phrase was heard, and we find mention of it in several texts, but not like it was heard in the Peasants' Revolt in England, and not like it was heard in the French Revolution. But it was heard again in modern times, it was the campaign slogan of the Bush-Reagan campaign and was used again in the Bush campaign. Now is the time. Now is the time. One famous photograph staged by George Bush and selected by George Bush for publication in Life magazine shows him lying in bed holding the pyramid with the capstone in place signaling to Masons, Freemasons, and members, the priests, of the mystery schools around the world that he is the one
who will bring into fruition their ages, centuries, millennia-old dream of the new world order. In our search for the Templars, we have followed them right to their gravestones. And on some of their gravestones, it shows the knight leaning back, reclining, with his feet resting up on a dog, denoting that he is the master. On most of the tombstones, however, we have found something unexpected, the skull and crossbones. Now, when the Knights Templars were persecuted, the fleet, they had vast fleets, an entire navy, disappeared. And no one, at least no one in the establishment historian group, claims to know where they went. But we have found them, folks. They became the pirates and hoisted their symbol of the skull and bones to the yardarm. They became the vast fleet of pirates who roamed the seas of the world and terrorized nations, navies, and merchantmen. And thus arose from the initiation rites of the Templars, the initiatory rites of crossing the equator, the international date line, and others, and accounts for the brotherhood amongst the pirates of the world. Even to establishing seaports that they owned and operated and where they could always find safety. Those on the land established what they called the Brotherhood of Death. Chapters were formed throughout the world. George Bush was initiated in the crypt, or what is known as the tomb at Yale, into the Brotherhood of Death, also known as the Russell Trust, also known as the Skull and Bones. The research of many people have revealed what the interior of the crypt, or what is known as the tomb at Yale, the fraternity house of the Bonesmen contains. And Anthony C. Sutton, in his monumental work, America's Secret Establishment, all about the skull and bones, and one other who wrote a magazine article and published it, revealed the initiation ceremony, revealed that swastikas were found inside the tomb, revealed that the altar is a pile of bones and that the secret ceremony that George Bush underwent during his initiation was thus. On the day of his initiation, George Bush was conducted through a long, dark passage into an immense hall draped with black. He was able to see by the faint light of sepulchral lamps, corpses, corpses, in their shrouds. The altar, built of human skeletons, stood in the center. Ghostly forms moved through the hall, leaving behind them a foul odor. At length two men, dressed as specters, appeared and tied a pink band of ribbon smeared with blood around his forehead. Upon this was an image of the Lady of Loretto. A crucifix was placed in his hand, and an amulet hung around his neck. His clothes were removed, and laid upon a funeral pyre in a fireplace, while upon his body crosses were smeared in blood. Then his pedanta were tied with string. That's his genitals. Now five horrid and frightening figures, blood-stained and mumbling, approached him and threw themselves down in prayer. After an hour, sounds of weeping were heard. The funeral pyre started to burn, and his clothes were consumed. From the flames of this fire a huge and almost transparent form arose, while the five prostrate figures went into terrible convulsions. Now came the voice of an invisible hierophant booming from somewhere below as George Bush lay in a coffin naked. The words were those of these oaths which the candidate had to repeat. Quote, in the name of the Crucified One, I swear to sever all bonds which unite me with mother, brothers, sisters, wife, relatives, friends, mistress, kings, superiors, benefactors, or any other man to whom I have promised faith, service, or obedience. I name the place in which I was born. Henceforth I live in another dimension, which I will not reach until I have renounced the evil globe which has been cursed by heaven.
From now onwards I shall reveal to my new chief all that I have heard or found out, and I shall also seek out and observe things which might otherwise have escaped me. I honor the aqua tofana. It is a quick and essential medium of removing from the earth through death or robbing them of their wits of those who oppose truth and those who try to take it from our hands. I shall avoid Spain, Naples, and all other accursed lands, and I shall avoid the temptation to betray what I now have heard. Lightning will not strike as rapidly as the dagger which will reach me wherever I may be, should I betray my initiation." Unquote. Now a candelabrum bearing seven black candles is placed before the candidate, and also a bowl containing what is supposed to be human blood. He washes himself in the blood and drinks a quantity of it. The string around his genitalia is removed. He is placed in a bath to undergo complete ablution. After this, he eats a meal composed of vegetables. At this time, he is given his new name, by which he will be known to all of the others in the order, the Brotherhood of Death. And with the completion of his initiation, George Bush joined all of the male members of his family in a long line of ancestry traced from Robert Ruse to the modern day. He took his place in the order, the Knights Templar, Freemasonry, and has worked diligently to fulfill his role in the completion of the plan, the great work, the formation of the new world order, the one world totalitarian socialist state, the destruction of all existing nation states, all existing religions, and enslavement of the mob. The very highest degrees of the order show that the rationalism and materialism of the thinkers who developed it were determined to stamp out belief in religion. God and any faith in a deity, the initiate was told, were human inventions and had no real meaning. Subsequently, this was developed further, and the member who arrived at the highest position, that of Rex, or king, learned that he was now equal to a king, and that all men were capable of equal advancement. Hence the need for kings over ordinary mortals was an illusion, and at the highest rank the title of Rex Mundi, or king of the world, is assumed. If you would like to get this genealogy, folks, if you're a CAGI member, it's $5. Send it in to the address that you'll hear at the end of this broadcast. For everybody else, it's $10. Good night, and God bless each and every single one of you. Amen.